Hello and welcome to At the Forefront Live. Inflammatory bowel disease is a painful illness that involves an abnormal response from the immune system. This can lead to damage of the lining of the digestive tract, causing inflammation, ulceration, severe abdominal pain, and more. UChicago Medicine is one of the few research centers in the country testing new IBD treatments. Director of the UChicago Medicine IBD Center, Dr. Russell Cohen, and advanced practice nurse Ashley Perkovich join us for a live Q&A to discuss the latest advances in IBD treatment. And as always, we'll take your questions live. That's coming up right now on At The Forefront Live. And as always, we want to remind our viewers that today's program is not designed to take the place of a visit with your physician. Let's have each of you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do here at UChicago Medicine. And Dr. Cohen, we're going to start with you. Terrific. Thanks, John. And thank you all for joining us today. So I'm Russ Cohen. I am the director of the IBD Center, uh, Crohn's Disease and Ulcerative Colitis at the University of Chicago. And I'm also a professor of medicine at the Pritzker School of Medicine at the University of Chicago. I wear many hats, um, but probably for the purposes of this uh, presentation, that will suffice for this point. And Ashley, uh, let's uh, go to you now. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ashley Perkovich. I'm a nurse practitioner at the Adult IBD Center here at University of Chicago. Um, currently, I see patients in person and virtually for their routine follow-up IBD care. So Dr. Cohen, we're gonna start off with a very general question, then we'll get into the, uh, the more specific questions. We wanna remind our viewers also that if you have anything that you wanna ask our experts, just type them in the comment section. We'll get to as many of those questions as we possibly can over the next half hour. But let's just start off with kind of a, a broad general, what is IBD and how does it affect the body? Well, that's a great question, John. So many people may have heard the term Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. They're the two main types of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, as the name implies, it's inflammation in the intestines of the body. Uh, it is also often considered to be an inflammatory response rather than an autoimmune response. But in reality, what's happening is your body's immune system that's supposed to be protecting you is actually attacking your intestines. Uh, people who have ulcerative colitis, since it's a colitis, will only have inflammation in the colon or the large intestine. They're the same. While people who have Crohn's disease can also only have it in the colon. That'd be Crohn's colitis, but more commonly also have it in the end of the small intestine, which is called the ileum. Uh, there are some people who have it in the mouth or esophagus or stomach or all the way down to the anus, um, but those are the most common locations. Dr. Cohen, I want to point out you're actually in our River East facility today because uh, you travel around and see patients in, in various facilities. That's a beautiful, beautiful new uh, uh, center, and, and certainly if uh, people need care, that's a, a great place to go get it. Ashley, can you tell us a little bit about diet and the important role that diet places, or plays rather in, in reducing inflammation? Can that help? Yeah, it's a really good question and one that's asked pretty frequently. So there's no known diet, unfortunately, that will help decrease the inflammation associated with IBD. Many patients do report, though, that by following a specific diet, perhaps the um, simple car carbohydrate diet or perhaps by eliminating certain things from their diet can help with symptoms such as bloating or cramping. Um, so we encourage patients if they find a diet that's helpful for them that they can follow it, but we ask them to do it in conjunction with medical therapy. Um, patients that happen to have active inflammatory bowel disease, so they're currently exhibiting a flare, um, specifically in their small intestines, or let's say that they have a known stricture or narrowing of, of the bowel or have had bowel resections before, we ask that they follow a low residue diet um, avoiding things like nuts and seeds because those can actually get stuck in the narrowed areas of the bowel. Um, and actually, we currently have a clinical trial looking at um, the effects the Mediterranean diet has in Crohn's disease, so to be continued on that. That's, that's great. And Dr. Cohen, can you talk to us a little bit about clinical trials? Ashley just mentioned one. Um, I, that's a big part of what we do here at UChicago Medicine. And in my mind, that's an important, I think, kind of a differentiator 
with the, the work that happens with your team and, and the other folks that work here at UChicago Medicine because there are those clinical trials and there is that research that happens at this facility. And you bring up a great point. You know, uh, our motto is we're at the forefront. And with clinical trials, you, you, you clearly are. We are one of the world's leading centers in clinical trials in Crohn's and colitis. And you also brought up the point that currently now we are coming, we are coming to you. So, for example, I'm in our River East um, office, which is right off Michigan Avenue, right by Navy Pier. Um, uh, many of my other colleagues come here, too. I also go to Orland Park, Illinois. Um, we have a beautiful center at 143rd and LaGrange Road. Uh, we're also in Hyde Park. I do procedures in Tinley Park and procedures right off of Michigan Avenue, um, 900 North Michigan, right by the famous shopping area, too. Uh, so myself and many of the other um, practitioners now go to multiple sites. So it's very, very easy for you to get in to see us. One of the things, as John mentioned, that we offer are novel clinical trials. These are new medicines. Some of them aren't even on the market yet or some may be on the market for other conditions that we are testing in people with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Some of them are diets, as Ashley mentioned earlier. We even have some uh, that are actual procedures that are done for people who may have what's called fistulas of Crohn's disease. So we have an ever-changing uh, menu, if you will, of options that very few, if any other place, can offer. Certainly uh, not av available in this area for, uh, to the extent that we offer. And even throughout the country, it's hard to find a place that would have as many opportunities as right here at the University of Chicago. So Dr. Cohen, let's talk about biologic medication. Uh, that's something we've heard a little bit about and, and something that a lot of viewers are curious about. What are the risks and benefits of this type of treatment? Well, sure. You know, people shouldn't be afraid of the biologics. So a biological therapy, um, insulin is a biological therapy. Um, growth hormones are biological therapy. Many people are on them and don't realize it. But when we talk about it, we're talking about really breakthrough, uh, what are called monoclonal antibodies in most cases, um, that have revolutionized the treatment of not just Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but also of rheumatoid arthritis, and der uh, psoriasis and some other inflammatory conditions. The nice thing about these biologics is, contrary to the commercials, they're actually far safer than the older immune suppressant medicines that we're using. True, they are given right now mostly by IV or shot, but that actually doesn't make them more concerning. They are, as I mentioned, safer because they don't suppress uh, the bone marrow, for example, or interfere um, with uh, certain pathways in, in the liver or other inflammatory areas that could cause problems. So the new stuff, the biologics, is not what you should fear. They're what you want to be on. The old stuff is basically chemotherapy, and we're moving from using chemotherapy for Crohn's and colitis now to using safer biological therapies. Very few people have any problems with these medicines. Uh, and if they do, we can usually just switch you to something different. Now this, this may be more than we can get into in 30 minutes, but what, what do biological therapies do? What, what, what happens in the body when somebody receives one of these therapies? Well, sure, and you know, I do wanna point out John, that virtually all the biological therapies that are approved uh, in the world for Crohn's and Colitis were tested at the University of Chicago, so some of our patients are listening to this right now, and they were the heroes that uh, volunteered for these therapies. Most of them work by blocking very inflammatory chemicals in your body that, that cause inflammation. Some of them actually prevent the white blood cells from leaving the bloodstream and entering the gut, um, kind of prevent, almost locking the door so the white blood cells can protect you against other infections and things, but they don't bother the gut. Um, some of them actually were learning better how they work because uh, they have other properties as well, too. So the important thing is, is that the therapies are very effective, they're very focused, and uh, they really have changed many people's lives with these diseases for the better. So Ashley, how can a person manage their symptoms without medication? Because I think, you know, a lot of times people, um, they want to try to steer away from that if possible. Now, we don't want to obviously give anybody any ideas that they shouldn't take medication if it's prescribed by a physician. But what are some, some things that people can do? 
Yeah, that's a very good question as well. So I would say that, you know, in order to keep your disease in remission and to prevent flare ups, um, you do need to continue your maintenance medications and you need to take them as prescribed, meaning the correct dose and at the correct dosing interval in order for them to work optimally. Um, if you are feeling well and you're perhaps considering whether or not you need as much medication or perhaps whether or not you can decrease your dose or, or go down from two medications to one, before doing that on your own, you really should discuss that with your gastroenterologist. But things outside of taking your maintenance medication to keep your disease under control are doing things like um, getting your stress under control um, through things like exercise, yoga, meditation, um, and also just by eliminating dietary triggers in your diet, um, known things that kind of um, can cause you to have issues. You know, it's, it's interesting because we, we always tend to talk about diet no matter what the condition or the disease state is because it does have an impact. The other thing we always talk about is smoking. People should should quit smoking. I don't know if that has any kind of an impact on IBD. Maybe it does. I don't know. But but diet in general is just so important. Diet and exercise to the health of a uh, of an individual. And I would imagine you probably see that in your practice on a pretty regular basis, Dr. Cohen. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, as, as Ashley mentioned, um, you know, these things are very important. And part of it, uh, as far as the diet and exercise, is, um, is feeling good about yourself, feeling well enough that you can do that, getting the adequate nutrition. Uh, you know, one of the nice things is that we offer uh, nutritional assessments by our registered dietitians uh, for people who have more serious nutritional deficits. Um, part of our uh, University of Chicago gastroenterology hepatology and nutrition group is nutrition. We were the first world center for nutrition and many of the top experts in the world train the, here at the University of Chicago. We can arrange uh, for that too. You know, smoking is fascinating. So Crohn's disease and many inflammatory diseases are diseases of smokers. Over half of patients with Crohn's are smokers and, it, and when smoking used to be more prevalent, over three quarters were. Ulcerative colitis, on the other hand, is a condition of non-smokers. In fact, most people who get Crohn's or colitis are first diagnosed in their 20s or so, but if you're diagnosed with ulcerative colitis when you are, let's say, my age, which will remain undisclosed for the purposes of this presentation, often it's because that person around my age stops smoking and they actually get new ulcerative colitis. Now, we don't use smoking to treat ulcerative colitis, but it is fascinating. And one of the ways that Crohn's and colitis differ is the impact of smoking. Uh, you know, Ashley um, brought up a good point and, about communication. It's really important that you can communicate with your medical team. And one of the wonderful things is that uh, all of our patients are encouraged uh, to sign up for what's called my chart, where they can have direct communications with our staff about their medical issues, don't have to wait for the phone call back, don't have to be teaching a class and getting an embarrassing phone call from your gastroenterologist. Uh, and it really has um, made it very possible for you to get direct answers from the people who know it rather than getting it from other sources. You know, it's, it's interesting you bring up my chart. I'm a my chart user myself here is not only employee here, but a, a patient here at UChicago Medicine, and, and I can't stress how uh, how right you are with what you just said. It, it is an invaluable tool. It's great to be able to communicate with your, your physician and your providers, and it's just really, really helpful. So that's another thing that, again, that, that we offer that is very helpful. The other thing I wanna ask you, because I think this kind of gets into this area. You know, we're, we're in this time of COVID right now, and many people are worried about getting out. And we've talked about this on the program before, but I'd like to ask, uh, both of your opinions on this. If, if people are worried about that, you know, I know that this is a very safe place, but can you offer some words of reassurance to our viewers so that they realize too that if they need treatment, if they need help, to certainly uh, get that? And, and Dr. Cohen, I'll start with you on this one. Well, sure. Well, first of all, um, we offer video or visits um, in case that people really can't do video. It could possibly be by telephone, but ideally video visits um, for both new and established patients. Uh, and med most people are taking advantage of that uh, as well as live visits um, when possible. Um, our sites are intentionally set up so that there's very few people 
uh, here. We all have the social distancing and masks in place. The only reason why I'm not wearing a mask is I'm in a conference room with the doors that are locked. Um, and, and for example, Ashley, who usually is, is with me uh, at River East, is not here today because this way we don't have too many people here. She's working remotely. So I'm seeing live patients and she's um, doing uh, uh, remote patients. So uh, we, uh, uh, we have certainly um, prepared for this. Uh, people who are coming in for blood tests, uh, we have them make an appointment to do so, so they're not all jamming into the laboratory. And this is also um, at our other off sites too. Uh, you know, those sites are very safe, very clean. There's really nobody allowed in unless the people are supposed to be there. Uh, it is concerning, particularly if you have an inflammatory or immune condition about the COVID outbreak. But we really want to make clear that the key is you staying well, you getting your medicines, staying on them, because that way you don't have to emergently go to a medical facility and possibly have an exposure. Um, the, the other thing uh, that's important is that if you are had procedures that are scheduled and GI, we do colonoscopies, as you unfortunately probably know, while they were on hold for a while, uh, we are doing them. Every patient has gets COVID tested ahead of time. Uh, with nobody who has positive for COVID comes into the uh, procedure areas. So we're extremely safe with that. And it's important to do that for, also for your other medical screenings. Because unfortunately now we're going to be seeing higher rates of breast cancer because people who are not getting their mammograms, colon cancer because people aren't getting their colonoscopies, prostate cancer because people aren't getting their prostate exams, and things like that too. So yes, it was very scary in March and April, but as you guys know, we're, we're at the end of October uh, and, uh, and the situation's uh, not going to change dramatically in the very near future. Um, so taking the right precautions, wearing a mask, doing hand sanitizing six feet apart, um, you can continue going on with the important things in your life. And medical screenings and appointments are certainly included. Yeah, I think that's just such an important message that we really want to get out to, to viewers. You've, you have to take care of yourself now more than ever. You have to take care of yourself. And if you need medical treatment, please seek it because th these are safe places to come to. And even what we're doing today, we're doing the entire program remote. The reason I'm not wearing a mask is because I'm all by myself in a room. You all are at separate locations. There's, yeah, see, there's nobody here. We don't even have a camera person in here. Uh, and, and the technical people are in a completely different, uh, different area. So we, we try to be very careful just from start to finish with what we do here at UChicago Medicine. And, and we've been pretty successful with it so far. Ashley, have you been doing some of the, uh, the, the video visits? If so, I'm kind of curious how that's gone. I've heard some providers even kind of liken them to to uh, the, you know, the old practice of making house calls. Yeah, you know, it's actually been going really well. Um, I think that you know, now that you're right, we are almost into November with COVID. There are going to be some positive things I think that came out of this, and perhaps being able to do virtual visits will be one of them. Um, it was a little challenging at first when it you know first rolled out, and we had never done them before. But now that we've been doing them for a few months, a lot of patients like them, they prefer them. Um, you mentioned biologic therapies earlier and Dr. Cohen and I typically will see patients every three to four months and want to get labs every three to four months if they're on biologic therapy. Um, but right now, if they're doing well and their disease is in remission and it's just kind of a routine follow-up visit, then we're allowing them to do the virtual visits where we just kind of touch base via video and then we have them come in at a separate time and get labs. Um, but this has gone over very well, especially for our patients that, you know, um, drive a far distance to see us. This has been very convenient for them. Um, of course, if you are flaring or if you are experiencing any disease activity or something new is, has um, come up, we, we will see you in person in clinic. But we're just trying to stagger things to keep everyone as safe as possible. And overall, I think it's been going very well. Great. Dr. Cohen, we have a few questions coming in from viewers that I'd like to get to if we possibly can. The first one, actually I'll do a two-parter. These are two questions from two different people, but we'll kind of put them together. The first is, how do you diagnose Crohn's or colitis? And the second one, are there pre-screenings for uh, uh, Crohn's or, or colitis? Well, sure. Well, most people are diagnosed by a colonoscopy, which um, is a scope that's actually thinner than my finger, really is. Uh, 
little longer, <laughs> uh, that uh, after you're sleeping, we go in through your bottom and go around the inside of the bowel. Occasionally, there are people who, um, the, in Crohn's disease, where it's only in the small intestine, you can't get to that very easily with the scope. So those people, we might need a CAT scan or MRI. Some people um, are diagnosed with a scope um, into the stomach, in the mouth, esophagus, uh, stomach. That scope's thinner than my pinky, too. And, and, and I don't have big... Uh, fat fingers, so you guys should be happy about that. Typically, that's how it's done. Uh, occasionally, there are some people who need um, other ways to, to find it uh, as well, too. And then, sorry, what was your the other second part of the question? The second one is just if, if there are pre-screenings that are available that uh, might detect. Well, you know, Crohn's and colitis are not that uh, common, but uh, and they most likely have onset uh, in children, teenagers, or early 20-year-olds. So if there's no family history, then there's probably no need for pre-screening. But if you have a very strong family history, particularly for Crohn's, um, we just uh, tell, uh, make sure if the kids are staying on the growth curve, there's no unexplained anemia, all kids are going to get diarrhea or constipation, stomach pains. But if it's a persistent problem, maybe have that invest investigated. Um, and then moving forward, we really don't do pre-screenings because you either have it or you don't. Um, uh, sometimes we do have people who are going for colon cancer screening, typically around age 50, although now it's back to 45 in some uh, people, uh, and they happen to find it incidentally. Here's another interesting question from a viewer, and this, this deals with COVID. One of the treatments for COVID involves the use of steroids. Is, is that a problem for IBD patients? Well, that's a huge problem. So let's just make things very clear um, with COVID. People with Crohn's and colitis or other inflammatory diseases who are on steroids, you need to get your doctor to get you off the steroids. It's far safer for you to be on the biologic therapies or the other immune suppressants than to be on steroids. Uh, we know this for a fact by very good databases and other information. Don't confuse that with very sick COVID patients hospitalized, perhaps in our intensive care unit, who they give high-dose steroids to to suppress the immune response. See, those people, unfortunately, the COVID has turned on the immune response uncontrollably. That's what usually does them in. It's not directly the virus. It's the body's response to the virus. So in those patients, you they actually, as you probably know, are giving high doses of steroids. It's a completely different issue. Okay, interesting. So, Ashley, what kind of signs should uh, someone look for if they, if they think that they're having a flare-up? So that can kind of differ depending on where the inflammation of the IBD is. So in somebody that has ulcerative colitis or Crohn's colitis, um, the inflammation's in the colon. So those patients may experience bright red blood in their stool, urgency, um, and cramping with bowel movements. Um, some diarrhea. Patients with, let's say, small bowel Crohn's disease can have symptoms such as abdominal pain, um, weight loss, fevers, of course, diarrhea. So some of the symptoms can overlap between Crohn's and colitis. Um, but if you're experiencing any of these symptoms and they're persisting and perhaps worsening and they've been going on for more than a couple of weeks, then you should definitely seek medical attention. So, so, Dr. Cohen, we've heard a lot about CBD and medical marijuana just in the, in the past few years. What kind of an impact do we see in this area uh, from CBD or medical marijuana, or is there one? Huh. Well, that, that's a, I think that's an important question because a lot of people are asking that. Uh, while there was initially a lot of hype about, uh, and there's a little difference between the medical, mar medical marijuana itself, which is marijuana, versus the CBD oils or CBD products, Unfortunately, as time's gone by, there have been repeated studies that have not shown this to change uh, the actual disease, the inflammation in Crohn's or colitis. Some studies have suggested it's worse with them. And um, there's a vomiting syndrome that many people can get if they're using marijuana chronically where they get pain and vomiting. Uh, it's called cyclical vomiting syndrome. So there's a lot of side effects to these that are not helpful. I, I think you should differentiate people who use CBD or marijuana for um, reasons that they feel good, it alleviates, it alleviates pain or discomfort, um, than actually treating the disease. So uh, our approach is 
if you want to use these therapies or other alternative therapies discussed with us, but also we would encourage you not to get rid of the proven effective therapies. Often doing things together uh, with communication uh, uh, has the best outcome. So Ashley, I think a lot of times people will start feeling better no matter what the, the, the disease is and then they don't want to take their medications anymore. Talk to us a little bit about that and the dangers of doing that, particularly with, with IBD. Yes, so unfortunately, there is no cure for IBD. Um, Crohn's and colitis are chronic conditions that require routine monitoring for disease progression and long-term medication use um, in order to keep the disease in remission and also to prevent flares and prevent disease-related complications down the road. Um, disease-related complications down the road could include things, as I mentioned earlier, strictures or narrowing of the bowels where um, you know, the inflammation over time turns into scar tissue. Um, the bowel becomes less flexible. Um, it narrows down, strictures down, and food can become stuck there, um, which can lead to bowel obstructions, a common reason for an IBD patient to wind up in the emergency room. Um, sometimes if they have a really tight or narrowed stricture that will require surgery or a bowel resection. And there are other unpleasant things associated um, with Crohn's disease, um, such as um, fistulas and abscesses. So if you don't keep the inflammation under control, you're putting yourself at risk of developing these complications down the road. So Dr. Cohen, is risk of cancer increased uh, because of IBD? So people who have inflammation long-term are at higher risk, usually in the organ that the inflammation is located. So for example, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's of the colon <clears throat> over time does increase your colon cancer risk. Uh, there is some data that suggests, just as Ashley was uh, alluding to, that <clears throat> if you keep the inflammation under control, you actually may decrease your cancer risk. And that's important because if you're a non-smoker, your highest risk in, uh, overall in the population in America is colon cancer. So if you also have Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, you have even increased that risk um, if the Crohn's affects the colon. The ulcerative colitis always does. So now you can potentially decrease the risk for your most common, most feared cancer simply by adhering to the medicines. And, and sometimes people are afraid of medicines. They hear things on TV about rare risk of lymphoma or other cancers. Your risk of lymphoma or from anything we give you is far less than your risk of colon cancer from having a potentially uncontrolled inflammation. Uh, you know, one of the things that Ashley mentioned uh, about um, the state of Crohn's and colitis, about it um, not being curable, well, we're looking to change that. Uh, we actually do have some breakthrough uh, research going on through my colleagues at the University of Chicago who work with others around the world. Uh, and many of our patients are part of these, um, these studies. When we do colonoscopy, we get extra biopsies, we get extra blood tests. So we're actually probably gonna change that, that line of it um, being lifelong. And people may not need medicines forever, but um, let us be the ones to tell you that. <laughs> well, that is, uh, that is uh, great news. It sounds like we have some positive <clears throat> things coming. Oh, yeah. Well, we're out of time. You both were great and shared a lot of really important information with our audience, so we, we thank you. And thank you to our viewers for your fantastic questions. Please remember to check out our Facebook page for our schedule of programs coming up in the future. Also, if you want more information about UChicago Medicine, make sure to take a look at our website at uchicagomedicine.org. If you need an appointment, you can give us a call at 888-824-0200. And remember, you can schedule your video visit by going to the website. Thanks again for being with us today, and I hope you have a wonderful week.